This week on Dig Me Out. The air from the fan blows so that the blue on the map on the walls. With your hosts, Jason Ziak and Tim Minichi. Jay, we're back again with another episode thanks to our Dig Me Out Union on Patreon. You can help us make the next episode happen by joining us at dmounion.com or digmeoutunion.com. You know, I realized, Jay, today, we haven't really done an intro where we explained this podcast. We sort of just jump into it yeah, every time. I've listened to some podcasts where they do that. And I was like, probably should be doing that. <laughs> I thought so. You I know, was doing and not assume thing. that everybody's been listening for 10 years. So if you're joining us for episode 620 something and it's your first time, because you're just happening to be a really big fan of this band and you're like, what's this? Uh, I'm Tim and uh, that's my co-host Jay. If you're watching the video on Patreon, if you're not, you're hearing his voice now. Am I breathing? <laughs> I was waiting for you to don't, don't breathe. That's great. Uh, we, we've been doing this um, since. Ooh, 1974 is when we started doing this. We we traded back eight tracks and uh and we listen and then we recorded on a reel to reel. On no, our we Fisher started, Price uh tape recorders. There you go. And uh we we like to check out 90s albums and we hope that you like to check out 90s albums too, because there's a whole lot of them, as we can tell, because this podcast is six hundred episodes in and we've barely scratched the surface. Actually, I want to I want to amend that. We have scratched the surface. In yeah, the same way that a... the earth is is very large, we have scratched a little <laughs> line in the dirt. We're still digging towards the core. <laughs> we scratched a little top. We took a stick and just started to like Yes, exactly. Started to make a square where we will eventually dig. So we we hope that you'll check out our very large archive of previous episodes. All of them are listed on our website, digmeoutpodcast.com. You can drop a name in that search tool and you might find them, or we might have talked about them in a podcast, even if they might not have been the subject of an episode. So what's the subject of this episode, Jay? In fact, it's a union member pick. He was not able to join us for this episode. Actually, he he hasn't joined us because he prefers not to. He's, He's like the Batman. He, okay. uh, first first to lurk in the shadows that's james that's stelter cool. jim stelter he's been with us for many years it's great having him as a member of our community um his comments over at patreon and you might remember he's picked some really interesting records for us jay back in 2018 it was lusk's free mars yeah then in 2019 it was this is the way it goes and goes by juno then in okay. 2020, it was Ponzi Scheme by Firewater. And last year, it was the Brotherhood of Electric slash or dash operational directive by Wellwater Conspiracy. Oh, right. So that's a, that is a very interesting collection of not really connected in any way records. Right. So this year, he continues. It's the 1998 album Transaction. De Nuevo, or De Novo, by Bedhead. Uh, Jay, uh, had you ever heard of any Bedhead before? Uh, no, I had not. Had you? I'd heard the name in talking about bands like Low okay. and the quote-unquote slowcore sound from the 90s. And I also heard the name of this band as a well, we'll get into it. I, I'll, I'll talk about who they inf- like, what their sound sort of influenced in the 2000s, but it's part of the review we'll talk about later. So this was Jim's pick, and he gave us some notes on his pick. He said, it's the third and final album before the Cadane brothers shifted into the new year. I'm sure there are folks who prefer Bedhead's other albums. This is their third record. Um, and those are certainly worth listening to. I chose Transaction because it's the one I've listened to the most. It is because it's the most, is it the most polished? Maybe. Steve Albini production perfectly captures Bedhead, even at their quietest. There are some faster songs that almost don't sound like Bedhead. It can make for a mixed record, but that variety is exactly what keeps the, interest, keeps the record interesting. 
uh, more than ever is easily my favorite. The lyrics, the simple melody, how it slowly unfolds into dizzying layers. Trademark bedhead. Braid is another highlight and follows the same format, albeit at greater extremes. It's easy to get lost in the restrained parts, only to be captured by the noisy bursts. Transaction closes with the present. It's seven minute glacial pace hanging in the air. Slowly ascends, slowly ascending until abruptly drifting off into space. Bedhead can take a lot of patience and attention. The payoff is worth it. Let's see if our patrons had any comments on whether they thought the uh, album Transaction De Novo by Bedhead was worth it. We'll share their poll results at the end, but Darren Lehman said, guitar tones are nice and clean on this album. Obviously, nothing is overproduced. The vocals are clear yet whispery. But the minimalistic and plotting nature of the music quickly drew tire, grew tiresome. Ian McIver said Bedhead is appropriate name as it sounds like the band is trying to drag themselves out of bed with bad hair. Decent single. <laughs> On the opposite end, Willie Dillon. Love me some Bedhead. Obviously, it's not for everyone. You're not going to listen to a few songs once and declare they're your favorite band. It takes time to build. If you're looking for music to punch babies to, this isn't it. What is the appropriate music to punch babies to, Willie? Please let us know. My, my goodness. Um, I don't know that I want to know the answer to that, actually. Yeah. They worked with Steve Albini a lot, so their albums sound quite good, sonically speaking. The Cadane Brothers continuation in the new year is also great, as their collaboration with David Bazan of Page of the Lion and Will Johnson of Centromatic in the band Overseas. Jim Copany! AKA Tank Boy, who recently joined us at Patreon. He says, I may be biased. I think it was around this time, this album, that most of the band ended up staying at my place after an empty bottle show. So I think he's going where the album on this. And then Jeff Genta said, Some Sparkle Horse pinback vibes. Interested after two listens. Okay. So we uh, should probably talk about a little history of this band because the name of the brothers, Matt and Bubba, Cadane, um, from Dallas, Texas. They formed in 91. Um, Matt and Bubba were vocals and guitar. There's some names here. Tench, Coxie, or Cox, C-O-X-E, is the other guitar player. Chris Wheat on bass, and Trini Martinez on drums. The band released a couple EPs, three albums on the label Trance Syndicate, um, which were What Fun Life Was in 94, the self-titled Bed, or not self-titled, Bedheaded in, or Beheaded. Oh, oh, I see what they did there. They messed with the spelling so that you would want to read it as Bedhead, Bedheaded, but it's actually Bedhead, Beheaded. Oh my. You, you, you saucy minx. Uh, that came out in 96. <laughs> and then Traxac- Transaction De Novo came out in 98. Um, they did release a box set through the Numero Group uh, covering all of this in 2014. Also, there was a 94 EP and a 96 EP, and then um, both on Trans Syndicate Records. And then they did release a. I think it's a split EP with Maka. It's called Maka Loved Bedhead in 2000. And that was the, I think, the last release um, from the band. And uh, interestingly, after the band broke up, um, the guitar player went, <laughs> went to earn a PhD in Russian literature, literature from Columbia University. Uh, as mentioned, the Kadane brothers went on to form the new year. They signed with, um, touch and go records. And, um, they also played in overseas with, uh, Bazan and Johnson. So let's get into this record. Jay, tell me one thing you liked about transaction de novo by bedhead. I love how the tempo creates this interesting dynamic i found myself hanging on the notes and constantly wondering what the next one was going to be so it just creates this almost a mystery around the 
around the melody um where especially with the the ones that are not as they're not repeated like they build and you don't quite know where they're going to resolve or when they're going to resolve and then they combine that with these kind of guitars layering over each other and sometimes even the bass driving the melody so the opening track exam is a good example of that So you don't know where the melody is necessarily going to be coming from, where it's going to go, and how it might twist. I found that unique. Uh, obviously, the crescendos, the soft loud stuff, I feel like I've heard before. But there was something about the tempo this is played at, how sparse it can be, how simple the drumming is sometimes to just create this like methodical, almost like a clock ticking, which creates like this expectation that, okay, I know what's coming next, tank, tank, tank. And then it goes somewhere else. And you're like, well, well, that's a weird little note. And oh, I didn't expect that note to happen. Uh, Something like uh, the song More Than Ever is another example of where in the middle of the song, there's this ascending guitar part and because I think the tempo it's played at and how sparse it's played, you just feel this tension of, I don't know, how, how high are they going to go? <laughs> like, it just keeps going and building and going and going and going. Uh, you're like, okay, I think they're at the end of the fretboard. And it's like, oh, no, they got a couple more higher notes than that after that. So I found that, that pretty fun. Uh, and it kept me, I think, uh, despite the slow tempo, which obviously can get a little bit heady and you can get lost in it, it kept bringing me back sort of these really nuanced um, guitar lines and bass lines. Uh, and then I also liked within that, just because it's so quiet, you can start to pick up on like the, the details of the differences and how they might be playing the guitars. You know, like, oh, this part they're using their fingers, and this part they're using a pick, and in this part they got a little bit of reverb on. And because they're so clean, there's so much space in the mix, you can start to really pick up on that those things in a way that you understand like why it's, they just be, they carry more weight, they carry more importance. Um. So yeah, there's a lot of cool like tension and um kind of hidden complexity in this even though it's like slow and methodical sounding you would think it'd be simple but it's it's really not So I enjoyed that. What about you? Well, previously when we've we've talked covered a couple of slow core bands, like Low is one of them. Um, 
I think acetone we did quite yeah. a while ago. And there, there might be other ones that I'm forgetting, but I think I really struggled with some of that with the, with the repetitiveness and the, yep. um, lack of stuff happening but this hit me differently and i don't know i mean maybe it's the time of the year maybe it's it's a good autumn record uh yeah i can hear that um but i heard a little bit more dynamic in this you know take a song like parade or the closer the present you know the slow build you know that's that's the core of this record and then in those songs you get a big rave up of distortion and noise and you go okay well that's you know predictable but they don't do that in every song like yeah. you kind of expect that like a lot of slow yeah. bands do that they build to a crescendo and then it's over and they release and then they're and then it's done but on songs like you mentioned more than ever which the, the band i was going to reference but Man, that sounded a lot like the first two Death Cab for Cutie albums. Sure. And I can totally see a band like this influencing a young Ben Gibbard yeah. and Lowe and, and those bands. But in, even in, in the way that the vocal and the, the melody is working in that song, it reminded me of, of Death Cab. Um, and there is just a finesse on this record with regards to the playing. Um, the arrangements, which are very simple, but like you mentioned, there are there are these little subtle shifts that happen. You know, there's two guitars happening on this record, and there will be times when it's just one, and then the second one comes in with a just a minorly different melody or 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 a counter or something like that. You just get these nice crisscrosses of sounds between those two guitars at times. Um and I don't know what tempo there. I mean, maybe like fifty beats per minute, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> right, right. But it it it's like it's like halftime from like nodding your head to a rock song. It's like it's like the right slow tempo is yeah. is how I would describe it. It's like it hits that, so you can just kind of nod to it. Not every song, but that's th yeah. that's the overall sort of um vibe of this record. Um. So it worked quite well for me in that the, regard. You touched on the repetitive nature, maybe, of some of the other bands we've listened to that would be close to this. Mm -hmm. I think that's what works about this for me. Is it, It's not... The songs that work well aren't repetitive, like I mentioned. They're actually... Uh, the lines are... Are, feel longer and evolving and kind of twisting and turning and done in a way where I don't know where the repeat is always going to happen. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they're playing with weird time signatures or anything, but there's just enough in the way that it's crafted and the melodies are complex enough that I don't hear that repetition, which for me creates a totally different experience. Like it engages my brain differently. Um, to like want to guess where are we going and how is this going to open up or change and like you said mentioned too uh, i want to second that it doesn't always go to the predictable fuzzy crescendo yes there are a couple on this record but it doesn't always do that uh which again like, it makes you uh want to stay tuned in to know where this is going yeah yeah there's and I was looking back, the other ones that we did, um, karate had some, some, not all, there was, there was some still core aspects to that. Yeah. Um, Ida. And it's not, it's not overly angular either. Right. And no, I think it's, it's what part of the reason why I think that it works in terms of it be, being unpredictable, like you said, is that I don't feel like they're confining sometimes the guitar lines to just like four measures or eight measures yeah. like it feels like they're it's much more expansive yeah. um and less repetitive in that way yeah so that works really well um his voice is like totally works for me on this style um 
if it, it was like too whispery, I think I would get annoyed. But he's able to maintain like a a voice but without becoming indistinguishable from like the rest of the record. And there's some interesting turns of phrases and stuff and that's happening. So sometimes that's really hit or miss with me too, because you it ever it ends up sounding like um <laughs> try to remember. Uh it just gets like you just yeah. get like that, you know, droll. I don't want everything to sound like Leonard Cohen. Yeah. When it's like uh, Yeah, in terms of what doesn't work, it the vocal is hit and miss for me. I think when the guitar lines are driving the song and the melody, mm -hmm. the vocal can fit under that and it works really well. Because then yes. you have two guitars, a strong melodic theme coming from either the bass of the guitar and a vocal that is just playing under that and he in the vocal then doesn't have to do a ton just kind of adding another layer and you know establishing maybe a hook here or there when the vocal has to be the focus so a song like extra mundane which in theory i should like a lot because it's more yeah, driving but... driving and fuzzy mm -hmm. But the vo the the guitars aren't doing much in those verses. They're just kind of like you know down strumming, which puts a lot of pressure on the vocals to do something interesting. And the vocal is just kind of a droning. It, it ends up like instead of it being like a tune that has energy, which I to me the guitars feel like they want to have, <laughs> the vocal and then kind of the drumming ends up sounding like. They're half asleep. That doesn't work great. Uh, Parade, I think the verses in that is the same thing. It's just the vocal is like kind of low and morose sounding, like mm -hmm. just forgetting, same thing. Uh, it's got a country vibe and the guitars are kind of interesting. They're doing a like a bend or I don't know if it's a bend or a, a slide or something it's got a bit of a country twang to it which is kind of interesting but it's not enough to to save the vocal um so i i mean i would honestly be happy with this band if it had less vocals uh mm -hmm. i think there's some moments where it works really well like you mentioned like more than ever is a good example where you really hear that um that uh, death cab kind of tone come through and it like locks up for me and it makes sense. But mm, to me, the what's interesting about this band is the music and the yeah. guitar lines and the guitar melodies and some of the bass work and the vocal isn't always the most compelling part. I agree with you because I think a song like exhume the opening track works really well because you don't know if this is an instrumental band or not. Right. But when the vocal comes in, you go, okay, that vocal makes sense. I really, what I like about that song is I don't know what he's tapping, if it's a bell or a chime, or if it's like the top of the um, ride cymbal or, you know, the crash, like the little, what's yeah. the part of it called at the top? I don't know. I'm not a drummer. Um, I the like bell. that. Yeah. Is it called, it's called the bell? Got yeah. It. Um, it's an unexpected sound. And, I like that it's a, such a high frequency. Like it's a yeah. nice counter to what is a a deeper vocal, and then also, you know, there's no distortion, which 
honestly, on those two up tempo songs, Psycho Matica and Extra Mundane, yeah. that's the least interesting guitar stuff to me on this. I record. agree. It it sounds like any kind of indie band from the nineties. It's yep. If you're gonna do that, then it's gotta be like a, the Sparkle Horse callback was good because there's that one song which starts it has the sound of the radio where it sounds small and then yeah. the song gets big and it's like a great pop song but he clearly like wrecked half the song just by using that radio effect and making it really small sounding like if you're going to go up tempo on this album it's got to be like really thought through and either a really really great song or do something production wise that makes it interesting because otherwise they just sort of like sound like noisy sonic youth you know wannabe songs so yeah but i think on the, the distortion on like the present that works for me better because it it builds up and it makes sense as noise whereas the distortion on the uptempo songs just sounds bad it just yep. it does not sound good in comparison to the rest of the record great tone uh which um on the quieter sounds songs they almost sound bigger they do sound bigger yeah even though they're using less distortion <laughs> uh, i think we at least in my brain I usually uh associate more distortion with a bigger sound but in this band's case they sound bigger more expensive when they're clean speaking of clean um you know sometimes we talk about who produces the records in depth and this is an albini production yeah i think you can tell because there's like no there's no reverb yeah this is so dry and clean um i think that works though i think if it was reverbed out it would it would be too washy and too like it needs that very dry production that he does i agree i have to though wonder if the louder songs that we're talking about psychomatica and extra mundane yeah they have a weird sound to them too we mentioned that they're not big and they're almost too separated mm -hmm. uh, like you can you can hear the distinct guitars a little too much because it is so dry they're just like, kind of like sitting right there in your ears and for uh, distorted guitars that can be weird um, yes you want it to sound like you know amps in a room you know cranked and it sounds like amps in a box in your head <laughs> instead like they sound like those, right. those amps that you can hook under your belt yeah, right. and walk around and play yeah <laughs> uh so i think his production is brilliant for the slower and quieter stuff mm -hmm. the up-tempo stuff with this band not so much because i just think their tones aren't great yeah it's better his production works really good if you've got bands that have great amp tones and like know how to eq their shit and like put the right fuzz on the bass and you know get a killer guitar tone yeah, this uh, is... i'm not sure this band is great for distorted or fuzzy tones it's a clean tone band to me yeah this is not a marshall stack and a in a les paul yeah um well, let's uh let's talk about our overall ratings for this record and we'll get to the patreon poll results in just a moment but jay were the album better ep or decent single i'm gonna be at a better ep and i could really see this being based on the stuff i picked exhume more than ever half thought 
Leopard, Le, Lepidor, Petrotera, what, whatever Lepid the hell it is. Leopidoptera. Leopidoptera, the I present. Think. It would be a very cool, mostly instrumental EP. Mm-hmm. Uh, where you'd have these moments of singing that would really have impact, I think. Uh, and create a, a very specific mood. And uh, to me, it would, it would feel a bit more cohesive as a sort of mostly instrumental EP with you know some spotlight vocals to really add some contrast. Uh, so that would be my my better EP. Where are you at? I'm I right there with you. I think I'm a little bit more generous because it's only a nine song album. I would lose three tracks. Um, Extra mundane, forgetting. I think forgetting is of uh, the slow tracks is the weakest, and then Psychomatica. Um, I would just cut it down to those six. I think it's a really strong EP, and you know it, it'd probably give you like thirty minutes. And so we're close. I have what five. You have six. Yeah. Yep. So, and and I gotta say, this is kind of the first time that this sound has worked for me in in a, in a unified way, um, as an as an album or an EP or what have you. Like, it's always been a struggle for me, but this one hit right because the leaves are turning and uh, the jacket weather is here. It, it reminded me right. a little bit of explosions in the sky. Yes, good call. Which if I think a, also there was like, maybe think like, oh, yeah, yeah. there's more delay, and this was an instrumental. Like, I could see, and aren't they a Texas band too? Go in that direction. Yeah, they're from Austin, and they were like ten years after this. Yeah, so it's entirely possible that they were an influence on that band. Yeah, good call. And also, good call to our patrons who voted in terms of you all went with Worthy Album, 43%. So, again, we had a three-way race here. And Better EP tied with Decent Single for 29%. But uh, the patrons, they were mostly on the side of either a Worthy Album or a Better EP. So, right in there with us. That's uh, That's not too shabby. Keeping and, it together. Uh, yeah. So we got to thank uh, Jim Stelter for his pick. Always interesting picks from Jim every year. These are, and I want to say that we had not heard any of these. Um, we didn't, yeah, we didn't know Bedhead, Wellwater Conspiracy, Firewater. Had we listened? Did you listen to Juno before? I think I had. I, had, I think I'd heard the name, but, but he, his picks are like right on my periphery. Yeah, they're like close to other bands I liked or knew about or listened and to. And Lusk, yeah, yep, Lusk too. They're just right there on the edge of what <laughs> I was. It's like over here. It's it's kind of hovering. You can see yeah. it out of the corner of your eye. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, uh, Jim. And if you'd like to be like him, you can join us over at Patreon by going to dmounion.com or digmeoutunion. Dot com and you can become a patron for as little as two bucks a month. Vote in our polls like this one or in our monthly runoffs. Three rounds of nine albums that are suggested through our website, digmeoutpodcast.com. And then a final of six. And from those six, we review a record every month. And they're all uh, suggestions that you, the uh, listeners, give to us. We've gotten through a lot of records this year and some of them are getting resubmitted and that's great. They'll get another <laughs> shot down the road. Yep. You know, um, right some now they're, they're down in the championship league. They're not in the premier league or, <laughs> or is it the other way around? I don't really understand how that. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the way it works. I, I do think we need relegation in some American sport. I think college football would work. Oh, I don't that'd think be great. everybody should be division one. I that think, would be a great way to handle college football. Yes. Yeah, that's Pick like a top 25 or something every year and uh, everybody else gets right. Rele- you're either relegated in or out, like turn this whole ranking system into more of a mm-hmm. a relegation tier system. I'd be I'd be all on board for that. 
Yeah, because, I mean, look, we went to Bowling Green. There is no yeah. reason that Bowling Green, in their current state, which is not good, should be playing Division One football. Well, but... But they should be able to battle for it. Yeah, I think what what's fun, or what has been fun for me in the past, I don't think this happened anymore, but there was a... Like when Urban Meyer was there, like there was a glimmer of like, hey, we could have one year where we're we play Maybe spoiler. We get ranked. Yeah, we get ranked. We play spoiler. Like something a miracle could happen. Like Cincinnati. Right. right. They've had this happen. Like they even made it what last year or the year before, right? They made it to the tournament. Yeah. But you know that those teams can't sustain it. Mm-hmm. Right. You're like, okay, maybe we get lucky one year, things roll our way, we become like kind of a Cinderella story, but we're not gonna actually win the championship. Whereas if you had more of a relegation system, maybe it sets up an environment like where you could hope some of the smaller or mid-sized colleges can universities can make it not only make you know a blip, but also maybe even sustain it for a little while. Like you see more like college basketball happens. Yeah. Where you can hold it, you know, for for a decade or five years or some span of time where it stays fun. Do you have a newsletter I can subscribe to? Do you have a sub stack you're writing about this? I do. My sub stack is called, uh, actually, I do have a sub stack. It's called Worlds in Music. Are you writing about this topic? I need to, I need more. I don't, you know, I've never written an opinion piece, but I think I might write an opinion piece for this upcoming sub stack. They come out uh, the first of every month with everything I've uh, been doing for the last month because I know people are desperate to know what TV shows I'm watching, <laughs> uh, what I thought well, of the latest. Uh, if, if you want to know that, you could join our discord you also so got a discord because we talked about that I, there as well i gotta say so i've been exploring my options <laughs> with twitter changing here soon mm-hmm. and uh i'm like hey you know i would like to support more pay, uh be on uh be a patron to more you know content creators that i like and i'd like to find more discords as a result of that because in my head i'm thinking they're going to be like our discord and what I'm finding is they're not like our Discord. Oh, I know. <laughs> they're very quiet <laughs> and not fun and not super. I don't know, we've got some very smart people on our Discord. Yeah. Uh, so I've been disappointed because <laughs> and spoil because I'm think I'm spoiled because our Discord, uh, not because of us. We, we've just been lucky enough to have some really awesome people join it, but. I got to say, if you've joined a Discord before through a Patreon and you're like, eh, this isn't that great, you might want to you might want to come over to ours and check it out. You might be surprised. Yeah, I'm I have joined a lot of Discords over the last like two years. I mean, part of it was because of COVID. We we're just like looking for things to do and stuck at yeah. home. But uh, I uh, of the some of the work that I do outside of of this, I'm on a couple Discords for writers yeah. and um, some of them have. I'm I'm not joking. Ten times the number of people, yeah, but with one tenth the chatter, yeah. Um, and then there's another one where it's very similar to ours. It's a lot of fun people. It's a nice community. They're all it's all in the writing community, and, and they're all in the same like genre space. So it's like very nerdy. So people are like, and there's no, there is no like being a dick to each other. Yeah, you know, if you even get close, you're gonna get hey, yeah. Um, but then I'm on some where they're so active I can't keep up. Yep, with them. I have a couple like that. They're 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 active and like I don't get the way that they thread the conversations and like mm-hmm. I can't engage with them. I'm like I don't know what you guys are talking about and what this channel is even about. But there's tons of people posting all the time, right? Um, so I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, I think the topics we have and the people we have in there. Uh, contributing and sharing and i'm always delighted when i go into ours and uh see what's see what's up i always learn something new and that's a lot of fun get in there it's, it's, and especially for old people like us there is a lot of discussion of new music too yeah oh like, totally hits the wheelhouse so that's yeah, for what's sure also fun yeah. uh talking to people that you know have the same taste you have yeah same ideas the same thoughts the same concepts the same <laughs> dare i say agenda which is to make 90s music uh relevant forever uh part of the way we keep it relevant is by discussing new releases 
on our box newsletter every week the box newsletter goes out with a calendar of new releases plus two new reviews of albums movies books tv shows what have you uh relevant to the 80s and 90s and sometimes our patrons contribute those reviews uh like ian who covers a lot of electronic music for us he's had some in the past he'll have some coming up and uh lastly apple podcasts is where you go to leave us some nice words and some stars preferably in the five range thank you thank you all who have reviewed us we appreciate it uh for jay i'm tim we're out and we'll be back next week with another episode of dig me out <laughs>